On the morning of 15th April 2023, Sudan's capital of Khartoum suddenly erupted in a sudden orgy of violence. The sounds of explosions, gunshots, fire alarms, and fighter jets above rent the city which had enjoyed relative peace in recent times. What followed has been a sad story of killings, destruction, and a variety of human rights abuses meted out to the local population as foreign nations scramble to evacuate their nationals from the country. While the international community continues to make frantic efforts to facilitate negotiations between the warring factions and end the conflict, it is the ordinary people of Sudan that have had to bear the brunt of its consequences. As many parts of Sudan fall under the occupation of various armed groups, the Sudanese people are living terrified of their neighbors. Background Measuring around 1.86 million square miles, Sudan is Africa's third largest country by landmass. To the north, it is bordered by Egypt, both countries being divided by the River Nile. Libya and Chad are the country's western neighbors, and to the country's south is the state of South Sudan, which broke away from Sudan in 2011. The country is very diverse, with around 500 different ethnic groups. In the middle and northern regions of the country, the Sudanese Muslim Arabs are dominant. Their long-standing political and social influence on the country, as well as Sudan's geographical location, has meant that the country has strong links with the Arab world and has been a member of the Arab League since 1956. The country is also home to several non-Arab-speaking peoples, such as the Beja and Nuba. Throughout Sudan's existence, it has been troubled by various conflicts of differing scales and dimensions. Shortly before its independence from British rule in 1955, tensions between the Arab Muslim and the Christian animist groups over the latter's fears of being dominated resulted in a civil war in which tens of thousands lost their lives. Subsequent conflicts such as the Second Civil War fought from 1983 to 2005 and the Darfur conflict were similarly disastrous and have deepened the country's ethno-political cleavages. Origins of the Crisis Sudan has witnessed several of the violent post-colonial conflicts that have ravaged many parts of the African continent. However, unlike many of these crises, the present war in Sudan is not one between rival religious or ethnic groups. Instead, it is a war of dominance between two former allies turned bitter enemies. The roots of the present conflict perhaps lie in the Darfur conflict of 2003 to 2009. Troubled by the violent actions carried out by rebel groups made up of non-Arab ethnic groups fighting the Khartoum government, Sudan's then head of state, Omar al-Bashir, launched a military campaign against them spearheaded by armed Arab militias who fought alongside the regular troops. The Janjaweed, as the irregular force was known, was led by Mohammed Hamdan, popularly known as Hameti, among others. The Janjaweed would go on to commit a wide variety of atrocities in the Darfur region, ranging from rape and mass murders to the destruction of villages and displacement of millions of people from their homes and villages. The al-Bashir government maintained and supplied the Janjaweed militia, utilizing it as an elite force operating independently of the conventional national army. A Personality Clash Around 2013, al-Bashir repackaged the Janjaweed group into a formal militia named the Rapid Support Forces or RSF. He expected to use the RSF as a personal army to protect his government from any future attempts by the military to take over power. Although this group was theoretically under government control, Hameti was in total control of the militia and answered to no one but the president Omar al-Bashir. In 2019, following a series of protests from civilians, the al-Bashir government found itself in a precarious position. Hameti allied with General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan of the Sudanese army to oust the government and take over power. After arresting al-Bashir and deposing his government, General Burhan assumed power as head of state. The new administration formed the Transitional Sovereignty Council, TSC, a ruling body which consisted of military officers and civilian leaders. Burhan sought to build ties with the US, Israel, and the neighboring Arab countries. However, the public remained dissatisfied with the TSC and demanded a purely democratic government. Matters came to a head when on 3rd June 2019, Hameti's RSF forces violently dispersed a sit-in organized by pro-democracy protesters in Khartoum against the new transitional government. Over 100 people were shot dead, with several hundred more beaten, raped, and wounded. In 2021, the Army RSF coalition would launch another coup to kick out the civilian members of the TSC and entrench the armed forces as the absolute governing powers in Khartoum. Many of the civilian leaders were arrested and detained. A Country at War Although Hameti and Burhan enjoyed a strong alliance at first, their relationship would take a turn for the worse shortly after the 2021 coup. 
Ahmeti had regarded his military partner with a degree of suspicion, and when Burhan began to reinstate some Islamists who had previously held high positions in the ousted al-Bashir government to their former positions, the RSF boss felt threatened. For much of Sudan's post-colonial history, it has been led by people from around the Khartoum area who now constituted an elite class. Hailing from Darfur, a region which is relatively rural and marginalized, Hameti was often looked down upon by the Khartoum elite. However, the RSF commander had built a considerable degree of power, influence, and wealth. He held massive investments across several sectors of the Sudanese economy, including transportation and gold mining. Furthermore, Hameti had built international alliances by sending detachments of his group to fight on the side of the Saudi Emirati coalition in Yemen. It is also thought that he may have received weapons including surface-to-air missiles from Russia in exchange for gold. The tensions between Al-Burhan and Hameti reached the tipping point when negotiations began between both parties to incorporate the RSF into the regular army in preparation for a transition to civilian rule. While Al-Burhan wanted a rapid assimilation program lasting two years, the RSF commander insisted on a longer timetable for this, drawing out over a 10-year period. While this impasse lingered, reports spread about the army massing troops in strategic areas around Khartoum. Fighting broke out on the 15th of April, mainly in the urban areas such as the capital city with the government deploying airstrikes against RSF positions. The Human Cost As is usually the case in war situations, the Sudanese people have borne the brunt of the fighting. With access to combat aircraft, Al-Burhan and his army have dominated the skies, raining bombs on areas believed to house RSF fighters. These airstrikes are sometimes reckless and end up claiming civilian lives. In the early days of the fighting, several foreign countries had to face the logistical nightmare of evacuating thousands of their nationals from the country amidst the heavy fighting. Meanwhile, although many have fled the urban which have become the center points of the fighting, some have remained. As battlefield fortunes seesaw between both sides, many civilians have had to live side by side with RSF fighters. After taking over neighborhoods, RSF men would often proceed to take up residence in the available homes in the area. Being a militia rather than a conventional army, RSF units often have to source their supplies from the communities they occupy. This means civilians are often persuaded or forced to part ways with their food and water. In return, the RSF sometimes warns the local people of impending battles and helps maintain order. However, majority of the populace fear the RSF and hope for a peaceful solution to the conflict. Sudan's Search for Peace – Possibilities and Challenges as the conflict slowly drags towards its third month, observers and state actors around the world continue to explore avenues for peace in Sudan. We must also consider the position of the major international power brokers in this crisis. The US and the Western world have enjoyed strong relations with Al-Burhan after he ousted the al-Bashir government. In fact, former US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met with Al-Burhan in August 2020. However, in the wake of the 2021 coup, the US began to distance itself from Al-Burhan. This means that they have little leverage in Sudan at the moment. Although the US government is reportedly readying sanctions against various parties and individuals in the conflict, many observers doubt that this would play a large role in ending the fighting. Meanwhile, the Wagner Group is reportedly arming and training the RSF in return for access to the country's natural resources. Indeed, Hameti did travel to Russia shortly before its invasion of Ukraine to declare his support for the Moscow government and Russia has long tried to secure a base in the Red Sea to give them access to the Indian Ocean, which lies on Sudan's eastern border. The Saudi and UAE governments who have received support from RSF fighters in Yemen are also rumored to have offered unknown forms of support to Hameti. To find a suitable solution to Sudan's crisis, it is important to remember the key cause of the problem. Two military leaders with immense power and material resources fighting to assume sole control over the country. Both men have records of brutality towards civilians and disregard for human rights. This can explain why foreign interventions have not helped at this point. Several ceasefires brokered by international bodies have been routinely flouted by both sides. Going forward, it remains to be seen whether the two warring generals would eventually agree to settle their disputes at the negotiation table rather than on the battlefield. Please share your thoughts about the Sudan conflict with us in the comment section. Thank you for watching.